You cannot base theology on experience. You must base theology on the Word of God. Period. That is why it is so critical that we understand what grace is. You and I are not saved because God owes us something. You and I are not saved because God loves all his children and wouldn't allow any of them to go to hell. My friends, God has done everything he can to keep people from going to hell. That is why Jesus Christ died on the cross. Listen, my friends, if you and I can go to heaven, just as some of these talking heads you will see on television say, simply because God is going to be accepting of all other religions and God is going to make a path for all these other religions, then tell me, my friends, why does the Word of God say that there is no other name under heaven whereby you must be saved but the name of Jesus? Someone will say, well, preacher, does that mean that, 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 that Muslims are going to go to hell if they don't receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? My friend, that's what the Word of God says. We say, well, preacher, does that mean that Jews, if Jews don't receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, they will go to hell? My friend, that's what the Word of God said. That's what Jesus himself said. No one comes to the Father except through the Son. You say, preacher, that's being narrow-minded. My friend, I'm simply being biblical. If you have a problem with what I'm preaching, I suggest you take it up with the author of the textbook that I use. Because, my friend, the Word of God tells us we are to speak the truth and we're to do it in love. I don't believe we're ever to be ugly, but, my friend, when you see somebody about to step on a landmine, do you not warn them? If you see someone about to walk right into the path of a rattlesnake, are you not going to tell them that they're about to take a wrong step? Listen to me, my friends. If you have bought into the lie of these name it and claim it preachers that are out there and you buy every book that they come out with, let me tell you something, my friend. The only thing you're doing is you are paying for their retirement not yours if you want to store up for your retirement my friend I suggest you spend time reading this book and knowing this author and following what he says because my friend anyone who tells you that if you just have enough faith in God you won't have trouble is a liar and the truth is not in them I have more patience with a lost person than I do with someone who claims to be a believer but misleads people by misquoting or just flat out ignoring what the Word of God says. Why would Paul write words of encouragement and comfort to believers who are suffering if they weren't supposed to suffer? Jesus said, the servant is not greater than the master. My friend, Jesus suffered. The Old Testament told us he would suffer. In the book of Isaiah, it prophesied the suffering servant, the suffering Messiah. Jesus suffered horribly for us. Who are you and I to think that he's going to make everything roses for us? Paul writes this in verse 3 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged. And the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. My friends, it is God's will for you and I that our faith grow larger, that our love for one another grow ever deeper. My friends, let me ask you something. If you are wanting your muscles to get larger, what do you have to do? Don't take steroids. What do you have to do? <laughs> Give me the non-professional athlete answer. You have to work out. You've got to go to the gym. You've got to have resistance. You've got to do push-ups, you've got to do sit-ups, you've got to do chin-ups, you've got to do free weights, you've got to do machines, you've got to do exercises that damage the muscles so that they might be built back stronger. Travis Pittman is a coach, weightlifting coach at Riverside High School. And I've gone and worked out with Travis a few times. Now all you've got to do is look at Travis and you can tell this guy knows what he's doing. He's also a genetic freak, <laughs> but he also knows what he's doing. His dad's a coach. And he'll tell you the same thing. If you want to build muscle, you have to tear that muscle down so that it is rebuilt stronger. My friend, if you've got a knife, what do you have to do to get that knife sharp? I love knives. Love knives. I, don't, I, I believe a man is with knives like a woman is shoes. You can't have too many. I love knives. And a friend of mine gave me a Gerber folding knife that is about my favorite knife I've ever had. It's lightweight, 
composite handle, doesn't hardly weigh nothing, and keeps an edge better than anything I've ever seen. But you know what you do if you need to sharpen a knife? You have to take some of the metal away. If that metal is going to be as sharp and effective as good, what good is a dull knife? Who wants a dull knife? I want a sharp one. I want one I could shave with. And if you want it that sharp, you actually have to remove material. You have to damage it to make it sharper. Let me tell you something, my friends. Adversity, trials, difficulty in our life, it damages us, perhaps, but it does so to make us stronger. If you go out and you've got beautiful hedges and, and things out in your yard, and what do you have to do with them? You have to trim them back, don't you? You have to prune them so that they might grow in fuller and more beautiful. That's what God does with us. My friend, God doesn't prune us through the good times. God prunes us through the bad times. God prunes us, shapes us, builds us up through adversity. It is through adversity that we understand truly who God is. That we get a glimpse of what Jesus went through for us. And that we also get our focus brought back to Him. He uses these things to build us up in grace. Remember, grace is not something we've earned. Grace is something God has given to us. Our faith is built up, our reliance upon God, and we grow to love one another more because we have gone through things together. Tell me, are you not closer to people that have suffered with you than you are people who haven't? If you have survived cancer thus far, are you not, do you not have a special connection with people who likewise have experienced that? Next Saturday is going to be Rachel's run. Bob and Angie Gleason, in honor of their little girl who went home to be with the Lord a couple of years ago with cancer, they saw an opportunity to minister to others. And Bob and Angie, I've said all along, are two of my heroes. They're not perfect people, but what they have done is they have taken the adversity that they face, they've taken this difficulty that they have gone through, and they have turned it into something beautiful. Something marvelous, something that ministers to so many other families. I have seen Bob and Angie through their anguish, through their suffering, through their tears, reach out and minister to families who likewise are going through the same thing they went through. Bob and Angie could have very easily gotten mad with God and said, I don't want anything to do with God. I don't want anything to do with them. I'll never go to church again. I'll never pray again. I'll never read the Bible again. If God would take my little girl away, I don't want anything to do with it. But that is not how they responded. How did they respond? They responded through the grace that God gave them that they were able to deal with that loss and turn it into something that God has used to glorify himself hundreds and hundreds and thousands of times over. Now, do they still struggle? Sure they do. But they have allowed the damage to build them up, to make them into something they were not before. My friend, God will give you things in our lives that will enable us to have compassion for other people. Bob changed careers as a result of what happened to little Rachel. Changed careers so that he could minister to other families going through what he and Angie and Katie went through. You see? Therein is how God intends for difficulty to come. And because of that difficulty, they look at other people differently. You know, Bob and Angie are the kind of church members that you always hope for. When they join a church, they get involved in everything. <laughs> Bob's a deacon now. He's also a demon in hell during Judgment House. Some of you would say, typecasting. They work in the nursery. They're Sunday school teachers. This adversity changed their life. Could have changed it for the worse. But instead, they allowed God to use it to mold them into who he wanted them to be. And they love in a way they never loved before. That's how God works. That's God's plan for us.